that ain't no job. It's live, live, it's all the way live. Don't even Welcome to the Chapter 13 Overview, The Worlds of the 15th Century. Here's the main idea. During the 15th century, human societies became increasingly connected culturally, politically, and economically, setting the stage for the modern era. Relevance. Imagine European history in a parallel universe. What if the Mongols controlled all of Europe by 1300? What if an Islamic empire controlled all of Europe by 1550? What if a Chinese admiral found the Americas before Columbus? I may be speaking Chinese right now, or Mongolian, or Islam may be the dominant religion in the Americas. History is full of crossroads, of alternative stories, and the 15th century represents one such moment in time. It is the dawn of European ascendance. The events of this century have helped create our world today in a number of different ways. Setting the stage. Way back in chapters 1 and 2, you studied the Paleolithic era, early agricultural civilizations, and herding peoples. In the 15th century, there were still societies following these models, though most of the world was hurtling towards the modern era. China was recovering from Mongol rule and about to begin a new dynasty and Europe was emerging from the shadow of plague and conquest, about to take a dominant role in the world. The Islamic world continued with new political systems, and the Americas saw their greatest pre-Columbian civilizations, which were the heirs to the Maya and Moche. This chapter touches on most of the topics of the unit, and studying it will serve as a great review as we wrap up the post-classical era. The shapes of human communities. In addition to the major empires of the 15th century, earlier forms of society persisted, including Paleolithic people, agricultural villages, and pastoral communities. In the 15th century, Paleolithic peoples lived in parts of Australia, the Americas, and Africa. This outrigger canoe from Australia is typical of the technology of these groups, who were able to maintain a functioning society without agriculture, generally due to the high availability of food. On the northwest coast of North America, for instance, hunter-gatherers enjoyed over 300 edible animal species. As the major empires of the day continued to expand, however, Paleolithic people will be largely absorbed into modern societies by the beginning of the 20th century. Agricultural village societies. This section looks at agricultural societies in Africa and the Americas. First, we review three civilizations in West Africa, the Yoruba, Igbo, and Bini, here in this part of West Africa. The Yoruba developed a political system of city-states, the Bini were organized in the Kingdom of Benin, and the Igbo rejected organized rule, developing a stateless society with its own systems of social organization. These societies interacted with neighboring empires, especially the Songhe, which you will read about later in this chapter. This section then goes on to discuss the Iroquois League in modern-day New York State, which is up here, and the development of a political confederation that was so peaceful and efficient that it inspired American revolutionaries centuries later. Hurting peoples. You've already learned about pastoralists who had a massive impact on events such as the Xiongnu and Mongols. Here we look at an important successor to the Mongol Empire, Timur. He was a Turkic warrior who attempted to revive the great Mongol Empire in the late 14th century. On this map, creating the empire shown here in green. His empire was the last significant pastoral state in Central Asia, the last echo of the Mongol era. This section then looks at the Fulbe people in Western Africa, who migrated east in the centuries after 1000 CE, shown in this map uh, with the purple arrow here. They had consequential encounters with their agricultural neighbors and a reminder of the noteworthy persistence during the 15th century of ancient ways of life. Comparing China and Europe. The dominant civilizations of the 15th century were China and the emerging nation states of Europe. The Ming Dynasty, shown here in orange, was China's attempt to re reset society following Mongol rule, and the new emperors emphasized China's tradition, Confucian rituals, a temple of heaven, and reviving the examination system. China's political system, a model of efficiency, revived the economy so completely that in the 15th century, China was probably the wealthiest country in the world. The voyages of Zhang He are a striking example of this. He set out in 1405 with over 300 ships and a crew of 27,000. By contrast, in 1492, Columbus sailed with three ships and 90 men. This picture shows the ships by to scale. So this is one of Zhang He's ships, and at the same scale, this is one of Columbus's ships. A series of six voyages took the Chinese across Southeast Asia and to the east coast of Africa and the Middle East, shown here with the blue arrows on the map. So leaving from China here, coming throughout Southeast Asia, through the Strait of Malacca, into the Indian Ocean, all the way to East Africa, up the Red Sea to the Arabian Peninsula. We can expect that they would have explored even farther, but internal political differences led to all voyages being recalled in 1453, and China turned inwards. We'll never know what could have happened if the voyages had continued. 
European Comparison State Building Like China, Europe experienced the strengthening of political systems during this era, but there was a significant difference. China unified under the Ming Dynasty, but Europe saw a concentration of small centralized states, with the map starting to look like the one we're familiar with today. You can see here we've got England, France, the Holy Roman Empire, which roughly corresponds to Germany and Austria. We must remember that culturally China is just as diverse as Europe, but in China assimilation was much more common than Europe, and focus on why that is as you read. This section also reviews the Renaissance in Europe, a renewal of classical Greek learning sprinkled with Roman and Arabic contributions. In contrast to China, Renaissance culture focused on individualism and a Christian perspective, setting the stage for the continued development of a distinct Western philosophy that focused on free will and decision making. These traits would play a crucial role in the arrival of Europe on the world stage in the next era. Maritime Voyaging. This section discusses two significant European maritime explorations, Columbus, west from Europe, and Vasco da Gama, around the tip of Africa to India, shown here in the yellow arrow on this map. Both journeys sought to gain access to the riches of the East, which have been denied to Europeans by Muslim dominance of trade routes like the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean Network. So the yellow is the Islamic world, and the pink is the European world, and they're trying to get to the brown, which is the world of China. So you can see that the overland route will be blocked by Muslims, and Muslims, as you know from Chapter 11, dominated the Indian Ocean trade network here, hence the desire of Portuguese to sail down here around the coast of Africa. And as you know, when Columbus sailed west, he thought he would find Asia and accidentally ran into the Americas. As you read, look for reasons that the Europeans continued their voyages while China did not. China's decision to recall Zhang He opened the door for European dominance in the waters of Asia, of great consequence to world history. The Islamic World Islam continued to grow in Afro-Eurasia as political rule solidified in four major Islamic empires during a time known as the Second Flowering of Islam. First, the Ottoman and Safavid empires. This section is a great opportunity to practice your comparison skills, starting with the Ottoman and Safavid empires in the Middle East and Central Asia, shown here in green and orange. As you have learned, the Ottoman Empire was a Turkic Islamic empire that advanced into Eastern Europe, eventually conquering Constantinople in 1453 and rooting a Muslim presence in Eastern Europe, continuing the struggle between Islamic and Christian states. To the east, another Turkic empire, the Safavid, continued Persian influence in the region. The Safavid Empire imposed Shia Islam on its whole empire, leading to conflict with the Sunni Ottoman Empire. Look for examples of conflict between the two empires and the complexity of the Islamic world, which was far from uniform. The Songhe Mughal empires were more on the fringes of the Islamic world, shown here in brown and purple. Like its predecessors, the Songhe Empire in West Africa saw the, its elite class embrace Islam, and the empire became a major cultural center in the Muslim world. Its location at the nexus of the Trans-Saharan trade route closely connected it to the rest of the Islamic world. In India, the Mughal Empire was the successor of the Delhi Sultanate, though as you can see it controlled much more of the subcontinent. Conflict between Hindus and Muslims continued, though the Mughals were more tolerant to Hindus than their predecessors. This section ends with a consideration of the importance of the Islamic world in the 15th century, discussing the port city of Malacca as an example. And Malacca is located right down here. You might remember Srivijaya from an earlier chapter. It's the same part of the world, but a new state. Now we turn our attention to the Americas. By the 15th century, the Americas were home to two major civilizations, the Aztecs and the Incas, who dominated their respective regions when Europeans arrived after Columbus. The Aztec Empire was in Mesoamerica, in the same location as the earlier Maya civilization, though this empire was created by people called the Mexica, and that would be right here in Mesoamerica, shown in orange on this map. The empire was created and maintained by conquest, and tribute from conquered peoples was a key feature of the Aztec economy. It also had religious significance, as Aztec theology called for human sacrifice to replenish the power of the sun. Prisoners of war were the sacrificial victims, and priests held a lofty position in the social hierarchy. This was an urban civilization, and cities like Tenochtitlan were the center of a vast and vibrant trade network, making the Aztecs the dominant civilization of Mesoamerica in the 15th century. The Incas constructed a much bigger empire, ruling over about 10 million people along the Andes Mountains. Here on the west coast of South America is the Aztec Empire, shown in orange. In contrast to the Aztecs, the Incas built a substantial bureaucracy, ruled by an emperor and with local governors in 80 provinces. The Incas emphasized cultural assimilation, requiring elites of conquered people to learn their language, Quechua. Economically, they also supervised a wide-ranging network stretching down the coast of South America. Many of the public works projects came from an arrangement of required tribute labor called Mita. This section ends with a comparison of gender roles in Aztec and Inca society. There were quite a few similarities, with men and women each enjoying responsibility in an arrangement known as gender parallelism. 
For instance, in Inca society, the Inca ruler and his consort ruled jointly. So both of these empires established powerful American states in the 1400s, and they would be the greatest challenges for European conquerors when they arrived at the end of the 15th century. Webs of Connection. This section surveys the various connections among people during the 15th century, and it serves as a nice spice review for the chapter. Politically, empires like the Ottoman, Mughal, and Ming inspired cultural connections, as Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam served as unifying forces in various areas of Afro-Eurasia. Trade networks, of course, unified the people as well, as the Silk Roads, Indian Ocean, and Trans-Saharan exchanges continued. Trade continued in the Americas as well, and we have a chance here to look at the region of Oceania by looking at the island of Yap that served as a center of ocean-going trade in the region with a stone disk used as currency. This section is a nice preview of the modern world, which would see intensifying interconnections between previously separated societies. Looking ahead to the modern era, here we have an overview of the modern era with its emphasis on industrialization and the population growth that came with it. It looks at three main features of the centuries to come. First, increasing globalization due to technology and trade. Second, the development of modern industrialized societies. Third, the dominance of European nations on the world stage. In future chapters, you'll see how these features came to be. For now, we stay in the 15th century. Now the 10 second spice review. Social hierarchies continued. Empires in the Americas and Eurasia interacted with their neighbors. Existing trade networks were extended by major ocean explorations, which would soon change the world. Religion served as the basis of political systems and affected each other in significant ways. And for a visual summary, we have here 15th century states and empires, and you can think of this as an opportunity to use the spice themes and conduct comparisons of all of them. So the book compares the Ming dynasty in China with the emerging European nations. It compares Islamic states in two ways, the Ottoman and Safavid in the heartland, and the Songhe and Mughal empires on the edges of the Islamic world. And then in the Americas, it looks at the Aztecs and the Incas. That's your chapter 13 overview. Happy reading! Come on and ride on the fuck Well